Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Please sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com for weekly updates about my podcasts, events, and more. Also, follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and also at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. And finally, join my virtual book club called Zibby's Virtual Book Club, which meets every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time until 3 p.m. and features half an hour of book club discussion followed by 30 minutes of Q&A with the author whose book we've just discussed. You can sign up on my website, zibbyowens.com, under the virtual book club section, or even on Instagram under the link in my bio. I hope you'll find me in all these different channels and enjoy this podcast. Today's episode has been sponsored by Jumpstart. Our world is changing fast, and in a time that is forcing positive change, my friends at Jumpstart, a national early education nonprofit, believe that the need for the quality education will only increase, with nearly 25% of all children across the country living in poverty and the widening opportunity gap due to the extended out-of-school time. Jumpstart, whose vision is every child in America, enters kindergarten prepared to succeed, teams up with 79 colleges, universities, and community partners across 15 states states to provide early learning for over 13,000 preschool kids in underserved community. At the core of their work is literacy. Their global Read for the Record campaign in the fall engages over 2 million people worldwide to highlight the importance of early literacy and make high-quality books accessible for all children, no matter their color, socioeconomic status, or zip code. Read for the Record participants are encouraged to read the selected book on the same day. This year's campaign book, Evelyn Del Rey is Moving Away, teaches kids about the power of connection, lasting friendships, and coping with change. To all mamas, daddies, educators, book lovers, and beyond, you can support this crucial campaign by visiting readfortherecord.org to purchase the book, donate, or support a classroom in need. Supriya Kelkar is the winner of the New Visions Award for her middle grade novel, Ahimsa. She's a screenwriter who has worked on the writing teams for several Hindi films. She was an associate producer on the Hollywood feature Broken Horses. Supriya's books include Ahimsa, The Many Colors of Harpreet Singh, American as Paneer Pie, which just came out and we're going to talk about that, Strong as Fire, Fierce as Flame, Bindu's Bindi's, and That Thing About Bollywood. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Welcome, Supriya. Thanks so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you so much for having me. American as Paneer Pie is like your, I feel like you've written so many books at this point and movies and you're like this like amazing creator. And you said in a note to me that this is your most personal book yet. So I wanted to talk about that. So can you tell everybody what American as Paneer Pie is about? And then tell me a little more about the inspiration behind it. Yeah. So American as Paneer Pie is the story of Lekha, who is the only Indian American kid in a small town in Michigan. And Leika feels like she has two versions of herself. There's home Leika who loves watching Bollywood movies and eating Indian food. And then there's school Leika who pins her hair over her bindi birthmark and avoids confrontation at all costs, especially when it comes to being teased for her Indian culture. And when a racist incident rocks their small town, Leika must choose whether to continue to remain silent or find her voice and speak out against hate. So like Leika, I grew up in a small town in Michigan. I wasn't the only South Asian American kid in town, but it was not a diverse town at all. There were, you know, daily incidents of microaggressions and othering. We had a rock thrown through our window. I have the same hair as Leika, like really big, thick, curly hair. And even in the Desi community, which is the South Asian diaspora, you know, there's really a preference towards silky, wavy hair. And so curly hair is is not the beauty standard. And in my town, that also was not the beauty standard because very few, if any, people had hair like mine. So people would walk by and touch my hair, tap it as they walked by. Someone wrote, put a comb in that rat's nest in Sharpie on my locker. Ugh. So yeah, so a lot of those incidents that are in the book are straight from my life. I adjusted them to Leica's story. But, you know, when I when I first saw the cover by Abigail de la Cruz and designer Laura Lynn de Cieta, yes, <laughs> I was so floored because there's this picture I put up on Instagram. That's me. And I was like, that looks exactly like me on the cover because I used to tie my hair back in a bun because, you know, people would touch it and people would make fun of it. And I didn't take my hair out. I didn't wear my curls out until I was 38, You're like kidding. a year and a half ago. Yeah. So, you know, there's so much from my life. And and Leica finds her voice 
while she's in middle school. I didn't find my voice until I went to college at the University of Michigan and it was so diverse and they accepted diversity and, you know, it was it was a strength. It wasn't seen as, you know, something that you would get made fun of for. So I didn't find my voice until college. So unlike me, Leica finds her voice a lot earlier. Um, so I hope that this book inspires and empowers kids everywhere to know that their story matters and that, you know, I hope it empowers them to find their voice. I'm looking at your hair now. I know this will be audio, but because we're on Skype, your hair is absolutely gorgeous. And by the oh. way, it looks like, I mean, I'm from the Jewish background. It looks like everybody I, <laughs> I know is hair. I mean, like curly, wavy hair. Right. I was, you know, just giving my daughter a function of beauty, like <laughs> new product for yeah. her curls. So I don't know. I mean, yeah. I think the things that like you feel are you're most insecure about end up being like completely, you know, it's like, right. anyway, <laughs> I think you know what I'm trying to say. Totally. But that's horrible. I can't believe you had to endure that in your school environment and all the rest. And I also couldn't believe it when Leica, I mean, I don't want to give anything away by describing what the incident was. Should we keep it secret? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that that works. (laughs) Okay. But I was also sort of shocked by that. And then even how her peers, like, how her best friend like almost wanted to exploit it for his own gain and how she felt. And even, you know, this is like so perfectly middle school, the way you captured some of these things. One, you know, the sleepover incident and having to like lie her way, you know, out of that (laughs) because she didn't want to be excluded from something else and like not knowing what to do and how to not be left out without hurting someone else. I mean, the politics of middle school are like, it's just stunning. And you just captured it all like so, so well. It's amazing. And then the added layer, of course, of feeling that sense of otherness. Yeah. And I loved your character who moved across the way, you know, very early on. And I'm blanking on her name, but I can look it up. Avantika. Avantika. So when Avantika comes and it's almost like a mirror for Leica, yeah. Does she want to like double down and sort of become good friends or does she want to push it away because it's a part of herself that she's not feeling super comfortable with? Right. And then how their relationship unfolds. Like, I don't know. So awesome. Anyway. Thank you. <laughs> and also Avantika has so much confidence, like yeah. especially like t- talk a little more about the way that she talks to the teacher, how even when the teacher's like, it wasn't India under British rule. And she's like, yeah, just like America, you know, right. <laughs> like you <laughs> moron. Tell me a little about forming these characters and if Leica was sort of the you in this who was everyone else and how did you come up with them all yeah so I did not have an Avantika at my school there were maybe two other Indian American kids in elementary school with me and we sort of huddled together a lot on the playground and stuff but yeah I thought back to when my cousin moved in with us when I was in high school and he was just with us for a couple months and you know, all those feelings of, oh, this person has an accent and, and so do my parents. And, and am I embarrassed of this? Am I proud of this? You know, it's, there's just so much there for a child of immigrants in, in a space that doesn't accept that. So I, I wanted to put that all in there and have a character who was so proud of who she was, you know, and who, who didn't take the bullying the way Leica was sort of forced to take it due to her circumstances. So I wanted that role model. And I also wanted to, you know, use Avantika to talk about some of the issues, the intra-community issues in the Desi community about colorism. I think just recently, a lot of those fairness creams announced that they are either changing their name or you know, doing something, but the the product still exists. So, you know, I I wanted to call attention to that and and show that there is still, there's, you know, racism and and othering within the South Asian American community as well. So Avantika was a great character to do that with. Growing up, my next door neighbor was a white boy. So that's where Noah came from. And then I guess the other characters are pretty fictional, but they are based on sort of a combination of bullies and friends from school from growing up. And how did you feel having gotten this story out? You know, I have taken a lot longer to write other books of mine, but I wrote this draft in five weeks. I wrote it in 2017 at a time when it felt like people in power were really, you know, condoning hate and and it was being emboldened and encouraged everywhere. So I I actually live in the same small town I grew up in. It has doubled in size. It's a lot more diverse, but it still has, you know, 
really bad incidents of racism still. And I had two young kids and my third was a baby in 2017. And I found myself so worried about whether my kids would face the same things I did because they're going to the same schools I did. And from that fear, this story just came and it, it came to me so quickly. I I've never written a novel this fast. I, I write picture books in several months and this well, this was in five weeks. And so it just sort of poured out of me and it was such a release when I wrote it. And I really felt like I had finally spoken up for myself as a child, you know, decades later. So yeah, it, it felt good to write it. Wow, that's amazing. And how yeah. great you can give it to your kids to read. And that's awesome. Yeah. That's so awesome. The things that happen when you're young. I mean, I remember like there was some incident in second grade where I like opened my rickety wooden desk when I first got to school. And inside there was like a script written note on like lined paper that said like, dear Zibby, I hate you from guess who. And I was like, I like burst into <laughs> tears. And then I also like didn't want anyone to know. And should I show the teacher? And should I not? And who was it? And what, you know, that could have been like, for whatever reason, I have forgotten like most of college, (laughs) half of high school probably. But this one moment is like, I could tell you every sense and thing. So I feel like some of these moments that happen to us for any reason are just, they're just the pain. And then knowing that our kids can experience things like that coming up and what to do about them. At least now you've written this amazing book. So anyway, it's just- I'm uh, so sorry uh, that happened to you. No, I mean, it's just- No, it was just a silly example. I mean, no, but it sticks with you, right? It's, it's that's that's totally. that's my point. Yeah, that was yeah. that was you know just everything becomes magnified, especially right. at a younger age. Whereas maybe now we could brush it off more, or maybe not. But I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get into writing and picture books and screenwriting and all of it? How did you start on this whole trajectory of your life? Yeah. So in third grade, our teacher had us write books and he bound them in hardcover. And it's really silly, but I thought it was so cool to see my name on a hardcover. I was like, this is what I'm going to (laughs) do. So from that moment on, I wanted to be an author. Somewhere in middle school, I decided I wanted to be a Bollywood screenwriter instead. So at the University of Michigan, they had brought in a big movie producer, director, and writer. And I had written a thesis the summer before, on, and one section was on one of his movies. So I handed it to him after he spoke, and then I thought I'd never hear from him again. This was back in the day of answering machine tapes. <laughs> <laughs> one day I came back to my college apartment, and his voice was on the answering machine and he called me over and to meet him. And after I graduated, I started writing for him. So I joined his screenwriting team and we worked on several movies. I worked for him for a little over a decade. That was, you know, it was so much fun to go, you know, to LA or to Mumbai and be, you know, just having dinner with the stars whose posters were on my wall as a kid. So, except I had to play it really cool. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So I did that. And then when I had kids, I wasn't able to work those really long hours. You know, we'd be working till like 2 or 3 a.m. sometimes. And I'd have to, you know, fly to India or L.A. at a moment's notice sometimes, literally. So I just couldn't commit to that anymore. So I started going back to books. And in between screenwriting, I anytime I had a break between screenplays, I would work on the book that became my first published book, Ahimsa. So I wrote that in 2003, and that first draft was pretty awful, but I would keep going back to it every year for 13 years, I think, until I finally got it to a good place. And that book ended up winning the New Visions Award from Lee and Lowe Books. And so that's how I got published. And then from then on, I just sort of switched over to novels and picture books. And it's been like a dream, a literal dream come true from third grade. <laughs> so, oh, that's yeah. so amazing. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank how do you, and how do you decide what to, what type of picture books to write too? So that I just, sometimes I just get an idea from my kids or, you know, I, I don't really know. It's, they're usually, most of my picture books are also about the themes that are in American as Baneer Pai or in a hymn. So they're usually about social justice or, you know, feeling othered or, you know, how to feel like you belong. So the themes are consistent, even if the books are, you know, one is 500 words and one is 50,000 words. (laughs) Yeah, that's amazing. And so what types of projects do you have in the works? Are you thinking of going back to film? And I know you have some exciting things coming up. And yeah, I'm thinking a little bit about doing 
some film stuff if I can as the kids get a little older. But yeah, I have I have a, a few books coming out. I have another historical fiction book coming out sometime early next year called Strongest Fire, Fiercest Flame. And so that I got that idea when I thought back to the only Indian representation I saw in my entire childhood in school. And that was when they showed us a little bit of the Secret Garden movie. And I remember feeling so weird about how the Indian characters are like backdrops in their own land. They're just props and they're servants and they're in the background. And so this book takes place in 1857. And it really challenges who we center in these kinds of stories and whose story is being told and who's being left out and what we consider classics and sort of rethinking all of that. And then I have a picture book coming out in March called Bindu's Bindis from Sterling. And that's about a girl who loves to match the shape of her bindis to her nani, to her grandmother's bindis. And then in summer, I have another book from Simon & Schuster, BFYR, called That Thing About Bollywood. And so that combines a little bit about of my Bollywood background. So it's about a girl who is really bad at expressing herself, who loves Hindi movies. And when her parents announce that they're separating, she is afflicted with this magical condition that forces her to show her emotions in the most obvious way possible through Bollywood song and dance numbers. So I'm really excited about that one. That's awesome. Wow, yeah. you're just like Thank a you. fountain of sort of creativity and ideas and output. How are you doing this? You have three kids. I have four kids. Like when are you, how, and especially with the pandemic and everything, how are you carving out the time? Like, how are you doing this? <laughs> yeah, it's been really hard with, you know, in the pandemic. It's, I really not had much time at all to do it because with homeschooling and my husband's a healthcare worker. So he's been at the hospital all the time. So it was just me at home with the kids most days. So yeah, not very productive right now, but even normally I would usually work at night. I would work like 10 to 2 a.m. And then, you know, I was thinking as when my youngest got a little older this year and was going to go to school full time, I was going to have more time, but I think we are virtually learning this year. So I guess I'll have to figure this out. (laughs) My youngest is going to start kindergarten or we're supposed to, I mean, is supposed to start kindergarten in the fall. And for the last few years, I was like, okay, well, when, when he gets to kindergarten, I'm going to have all kinds of time, you know, like little (laughs) did I know that like, you know, his three hour preschool was the biggest break I would have for years to come or whatever. (laughs) It seems sort of, (laughs) oh my gosh. So when you, when you work from 10 to two, which is like insanely impressive and amazing, how do you, do you, do the words just like flow out? I know you said for this last one for the, it took you just five weeks. Do you outline the whole thing? Do you like, what's your process like? Do you have it all set up and then you just write, like, tell me a little more about your process. Yeah. Yeah, I do. So because of the screenwriting, so I, I was a film major in college. So I studied like with a concentration on screenwriting. So because of that background, it's, it was really drilled into us that you have to outline, outline, outline all the time. So yeah, I definitely, I think about the book for a long time for several weeks until I understand the character and I'll handwrite notes in a notebook. And then I go to the computer to outline and I work on that for a long time. Usually in the case of American is Your Pie, it sort of all just fell into place, but I will work on the outline for a long time. And I use a three act structure from screenwriting in my books. And then I start writing. And then once I once I write it, I have several critique partners that I share with and I get their feedback. Then I send it to my agent and I incorporate her feedback. And then if it's ready to go out, it goes out. <laughs> wow. I know it takes a takes a village, all of it. <laughs> <laughs> it does. <laughs> Can you go back to what you said earlier in our conversation about not wearing your hair down until you were 38 years old? What was the what changed? What was that moment like? Like, what was the day where you said, I'm wearing it down and I'm wearing it curly? And just like, tell me about that moment. Yeah, of I was actually in edits on this book. And I was like, you know what, I I'm being a hypocrite if I'm still like ashamed of my hair when Leica is you know, going through this whole process to learn to love herself. So one day I just did it and I was like, oh, this is what it feels like to have the breeze go through your hair. Like I haven't felt this since I was a little kid, you know, so I did it. And and I have to admit, I was very awkward and nervous doing it because my whole life I had been told this is ugly and this should be, you know, 
brushed and tied back and and or you're not brushing it right if it's looking like that even though this is my hair if you if I brush it it's it's going to be just all knotted so you know it took a while and and I finally got used to it and you know I'm I'm so happy I finally did this it took a few decades but I'm glad I did it have you I don't know maybe you already have and I couldn't I didn't find it but you should write an essay about this experience about this I whole should. thing. I haven't. You yeah. should. You have to write it. Yeah. It's like such, yeah. it's a perfect time for it and such a like metaphor, yeah. this whole letting your hair down. And I don't yeah, know. that's a great idea. Okay. So you get right to that. I'll. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have advice for aspiring authors? Yeah. I would say to read as much as you can because you learn so much from every book you read, even if you don't like a book, I think you can understand, oh, what didn't I like about this? Did I not like the way the character was developed? Did I not like the turns and the plot? So I would say read a ton and, you know, don't be attached to your words. I know it's a whole process to get to that point where you understand that the first draft is not the perfect draft and that you need other readers to look at it and take their feedback into consideration. But yeah, just don't be attached to your words and be prepared to revise a lot. Like I said, with Ahimsa, that was over a decade of revisions. And if I had stopped revising, it would never have won this award and I would never have been published. So yeah, read and revise. Wow. And what about to somebody out there who might be going through the type of otherness and hatred and discrimination in any sort and really just needs that encouragement that it's going to get better How about some empowering words? You know, I would just say to remember that your story matters and you are important and the world deserves to hear your story. When I was growing up, when I look back at all the books I had written as a kid, every character was white with yellow hair when I'd illustrated it, which would have been great if that was me, but that's not how I looked. But I never saw myself in a book or a TV show or a movie growing up. There just, there was not that representation. So I thought, Somewhere along the the way, I got the message that I, you know, my story didn't matter. I was erased from our American, you know, current history. So I would just say to remember that you do matter and the world is a better place because you're here and we all would love to hear your story. Every character I made up as a kid was usually named Cindy with blonde hair and blue eyes. Yeah. Often she was a twin, <laughs> not always. But I don't know what my fascination was. Like, I don't know. My Barbie dolls? I, I don't know. I don't know what it was. But that is certainly not what I looked like. Although, yeah. you know, the highlights are helping. But <laughs> I'll never quite get there. <laughs> anyway, I guess it's in a way it's one of those, like, wanting what you can't have. Although, frankly, I wouldn't yeah. really want it because it sounds like a lot of upkeep to be blonde when you get older. So, you know, this is a blessing. <laughs> Anyway, well, thank you so much. Thanks for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks for this great book, American as Paneer Pie. And now I have to go get your children's books for my little guys. And I'm really impressed. You're so articulate and thoughtful. And the messages in your book are really important and great. And how amazing to target it to the to the age group that needs it most to make the biggest impact going forward for the whole world. So anyway, thank you for your contributions. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for having me on. It's my pleasure. Okay. Have a great day. (laughs) Thank you. Bye. Thanks again to Jumpstart, whose campaign Read for the Record begins this fall. Go to readfortherecord.org to purchase Evelyn Del Rey is Moving Away to help donate and support a classroom in need and help Jumpstart reach their goal of achieving early literacy for everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 